The week of December 9th through the 15th was Computer Science Education Week. This year, the organization Code.org created the Hour of Code, a campaign to engage students in an hour of coding or programming. They aim to reach 10 million kids to generate interest in computer science and computer programming. In eight participating middle and high schools in APS, students aren't doing just an hour of code. Instead, they've engaged in hours and hours of code in a project called Scalable Game Design. The work students do in Scalable Game Design is interest-driven learning. Students develop video games and science simulations using the programs Agent Sheets and Agent Cubes. When their designs are complete, the students upload their games and simulations to an arcade so the world can enjoy their creations. Scalable Game Design and APS is a partnership between our school district and the University of Colorado at Boulder connected to research conducted by Dr. Alex Repening and his team, research funded by Google and the National Science Foundation. To mark Computer Science Education Week and highlight the work of participating teachers in schools, the Educational Technology Department visited classrooms to interview students. We also discussed the Scalable Game Design Project with students and teachers in two webinars. The first webinar was a student-led Google Hangout featuring Sean, an 8th grader at Marachek Middle School, with a passion for computer science and game design. Sean shared his current project, a virus simulation, and, with Dr. Repening and a panel of educators, discussed what he's learned from three years of experience with scalable game design. Also, the National Writing Project's Educator Innovator webinar series featured APS during Computer Science Education Week. Our discussion panel included Dr. Repening from CU Boulder, Kevin Rebow and Joe Dillon from APS EdTech, as well as two middle school technology teachers using scalable game design in the classroom. Lois Richards from North Middle School, and Mark Schuldice from Marachek Middle School. It was pretty hard because we, it was our first time making a game using agent sheets. I think um, editing the behaviors and trying to uh, make yours original from like everyone else's is the most challenging part. So in this case, we would designing a game, we're going to investigate the type of game that we're making. So we're going to look at like our options and like the history of it. We're trying to program the, well, we're trying to program a contagion simulation, which shows death and sick and the chance of recovery or the chance of getting sick. So it shows, so you're trying to have it where you have two people, one that's sick and it's spreading the sickness and yet dying, or if it's not serious enough, just getting sick and recovering. The game I own is well, what I'm trying to do right now, for the monitor to, like, to help the people get like, healthy again. I'm gonna try to make it like, so whoever's playing the game can move like move the doctor around to help to get to the sick people, make them healthy. So then just like getting healthy on their own. Today we were trying to work on making our contagion sim. And basically we're just programming some little sims to actually move around, get each other sick, and it, some might die and the others might get healthy and keep moving. And at the end, at the end, some might live, some might die, or it might be a mixture of them both. So we have been doing research on the idea of bringing computer science to students for a long time. And we realized that many of the activities that were focused on after school programs just didn't reach enough students. So one of the problems were just tools. So we early on, in fact, that was in 1995, we started to pioneer tools that are drag and drop programming tools to make things more accessible with agent sheets and later agent cubes. But then it became clear that the really big hurdle was to actually develop a curriculum that had to be part of schools. So, so we said, 
what can we do to make game design, for instance, an activity that we could introduce to schools to motivate many more students, but to get everybody in, involved, not just the, the students that come to a Friday afternoon computer club. And then we started to go to various different schools in the Boulder Valley School District initially, and now also in Aurora Public Schools, and, and we realized we, we can reach an enormous number of students. So for instance, in Mark's uh, class, I believe he has in the neighborhood of 300 students per year at, at that school. And, and that, that's something that allows us to, to reach everybody, the boys, the girls, minority students, and that's what we were very excited about. The goal of this um, work is to excite students initially with game design and to give them computational thinking skills, which later they can actually leverage and make science simulations and to, to really become part of a 21st century workforce that has these kind of computational thinking skills, which are so super important. Sean, I think that's interesting. And one of the questions I have for you is, when you first started programming, like the game that was patterned after Frogger, yeah. what did you find challenging then? Now that you're doing a virus simulation, what do you find challenging now? Um, what I found challenging then was trying to create everything so that it all was compact and didn't run on um, once everys all the time, or a ton of while running rules. And so now I see that things don't always add up so that like the mitosis, like I was saying in the body, it isn't always working perfectly. So you have to go back and find out what, it, so you have to troubleshoot more often than you did when you started with just simple rules. Dig deeper. So do you think the when you created these games, how many games do you think you, you created before you started the, the simulation? Five, maybe? Five Two games. Weeks. But so so you, you talked about this idea that you know sometimes things don't always work the way you, you hope they would, and that's of course a very frequent uh, thing, you know, in, in computer science that's the, the the idea of debugging. But do you think you, you learned some good skills when you made the games? Did that help you sort of using strategies or ideas that you could also use to debug your simulation? Yes, many, many things that you can, that you learn. Uh, so you learn how to backtrack and save often so you know if something does go wrong and you test everything as often as you can. So if something does go wrong, you know exactly where it, when it happened and where you could fix it. It's troubleshooting techniques. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sean, um, when you were making the five games um, that you were speaking of, those kind of, you were given templates to kind of play around with. With your, is that true? Did, were you given kind of templates to look at or models to help kind of guide you in making those five games? Yeah, he gave, um, like, we were given the uh, website, and we were given, um, like, worksheets, not worksheets, but um, screenshots. screenshots that help to explain the rules and what happened. But, of course, those are just basic outlines. You can take those and do anything from those. Okay, so that leads me to my real question, which is, once you, you move to making a simulation of the human body, which and, and virus infection, which is insanely complicated in real life. Um, were you were you creating that simulation kind of from scratch, using the tools that you you learned from the games? Was there a template you're following, or is that just something that you're you're trying to simulate real life on your own to the best of your ability? Um, I was given the assignment, and then I sort of went off and did what I knew. So we were given. So we're told to make a virus simulation, and then I decided that I wanted to get in depth in the bloodstream, to the body, to airports, to beyond the countries, I guess. Oh, so how it's spreading, like, potentially globally, like an epidemic then, yeah? Pandemic. Yep. Pandemic. Pandemic. <laughs> We 
we all did as a class was Frogger. I think that was like two weeks ago. Um, it was pretty hard because we, it was our first time making a game using alien seeds. And we didn't know how to like program it to program the frog to move and to die when it touches the um, water or gets hit by the car. And I guess like it's difficult, but then now that I'm doing a different game, I kind of know I kind of know what I'm doing, but I can still get stuck. Um. Well, I make my characters, my depictions look different from everyone else's, and I just try to add more unique obstacles to mine. Well, I'm creating right now is kind of like a murder mystery RPG kind of game. Um, I really enjoy like free roam games and RPG games where I get to kind of just walk around. So I thought I could kind of create that. Um, learning how, well, we learned how to like move around and everything. So I kind of implied that with building like a surround with um, like a background and everything. And then um, adding a little information that I know about um, from um, everything that I know about from the past, I can kind of imply into right now and kind of put everything together to make my game. So the basic point of my game is you're walking around and you see these clues. Um, and there's different, you're walking around the house and there's different clues throughout the house that you have to find. And then you go into this room with all of your suspects and you um, get the basic information that you need to um, find out who the murderer is and then you choose. And so we have also looked at different pedagogies such as inquiry-based approaches. So if the teacher instead really says, now we have a challenge here in our Frogger game, for instance, where we want to have, a, well, the truck is about to hit the frog, how should we come? How should we think about this? Should we think about this from the viewpoint of the frog or from the viewpoint of the truck? And how would we think about this? The moment where these kinds of strategies are being used, turns out the level of interests are essentially the same in boys and, and girls. And that's exciting because it's not a trade-off. So we're not saying, well, if we teach like this, teach like that, then we lose the other half. So, so basically there is a sweet spot where we can use then the boys will enjoy it more or less or if it's teaching approaches such as um, inquiry-based approaches that actually benefit both boys and girls. <laughs>